The British South Africa Company's administration of what became Rhodesia was chartered in 1889 by Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom, and began with the pioneer columns march northeast to Mashonaland in 1890. Empowered by its charter to acquire, govern and develop the area north of the Transvaal in southern Africa, the company, headed by Cecil Rhodes, raised its own armed forces and carved out a huge block of territory through treaties, concessions and occasional military action, most prominently overcoming the Matabele army in the First and Second Matabele Wars of the 1890s. By the turn of the century, Rhodes's company held a vast, land-locked country, bisected by the Zambezi River. It officially named this land Rhodesia in 1895, and ran it until the early 1920s. The area south of the Zambezi became southern Rhodesia, while that to the north became northwestern and northeastern Rhodesia, which were joined in 1911 to form northern Rhodesia. Within northern Rhodesia, there was a separate kingdom called Baratsland which later became a British protectorate alongside other territories under the British sphere of influence. Each territory was administered separately, with an administrator heading each territorial legislature. In southern Rhodesia, which attracted the most white immigrants and developed fastest, a legislative council was established in 1898. This comprised a blend of company nominated officials and elected members, with the numbers of each fluctuating over time. Partially motivated by Rhodes's dream of a Cape to Cairo railway, railway and telegraph lines were laid across previously barren Rhodesia with great speed, linking South Africa to the Belgian Congo's southern Katanga province by 1910. The British South Africa Police, responsible for law enforcement in southern Rhodesia, was established in 1896. A number of police forces north of the river amalgamated to form the Northern Rhodesia Police in 1911. Northern and Southern Rhodesians fought alongside the British in the Second Boer War and the First World War. About 40% of Southern Rhodesian white men fought in the latter, mostly on the Western Front in Europe. Black soldiers served in East Africa with the Rhodesia Native Regiment. As the number of elected members in the Legislative Council rose, power in southern Rhodesia gradually transferred from complete company rule to effective self-government by the growing number of white settlers. In a 1922 referendum, Southern Rhodesians chose responsible government within the British Empire over incorporation into the Union of South Africa. The company's charter was duly revoked by Whitehall in 1923, and Southern Rhodesia became a self-governing colony of Britain in October that year. Northern Rhodesia became a directly run British protectorate in April 1924. Topic: Origins. Topic: Rhodes's dream. Amid the scramble for Africa during the 1880s, the South African-based businessman and politician Cecil Rhodes envisioned the annexation to the British Empire of a block of territory connecting the Cape of Good Hope and Cairo—respectively at the southern and northern tips of Africa—and the concurrent construction of a line of rail linking the two. On geopolitical maps, British territories were generally marked in red or pink, so this concept became known as the Cape to Cairo Red Line. 
In the immediate vicinity of the Cape, this ambition was challenged by the presence of independent states to the northeast of Britain's Cape Colony, there were several Boer republics, and to the north of these was the Kingdom of Matabulin, ruled by La Bengala. Having secured the Rudd concession on mining rights from La Bengala in October 1888, Rhodes and his British South Africa Company were granted a royal charter by Queen Victoria in October 1889. The company was empowered under this charter to trade with local rulers, form banks, own and manage land, and raise and run a police force. In return for these rights, the company would govern and develop any territory it acquired, while respecting laws enacted by extant African rulers, and upholding free trade within its borders. <laughs> North to the Zambezi, territorial rivalry with Portugal The projected company sphere was initially Matabeoland and its immediate neighbours between the Limpopo River and the Zambezi. Portugal's colonies in Angola and Mozambique, coastal territories respectively to the west and east of this general area, were over three centuries old, and Lisbon's alliance with Britain formally dated back to the 1386 Treaty of Windsor. However, the exceedingly lethargic pace of local Portuguese colonization and development was such that even in the 1880s, Portugal's dominions in Mozambique comprised only a few scattered ports, harbours and plantations, all of which were administered from the island of Mozambique, just north of the Mozambique Channel. Angola differed little, with gigantic tracts of hinterland coming under the largely nominal purview of Portugal's modest colony on the coast. Rhodes quietly planned to annex some of Mozambique into the company domain so he could establish a major port at the mouth of the Pungwe River. He thought this might make an ideal sea outlet for his proposed settlement in Mashanaland, the area directly to Matabulan's northeast where La Bengala held dominion over many Mashona chiefs. Rhodes believed that the Portuguese claim to Mozambique was tenuous enough that he could win much of it without provoking major ire. The occupation of the Portuguese even along the coast line is in most places merely a paper one," he wrote to Whitehall in late 1889, "...and if this has not been recognized by international agreement I think it might be left open." But contrary to Rhodes's opinion, general consensus at the Berlin Conference of 1884–85 had made Portugal's hold over the Mozambican coastline very secure. The Portuguese had expanded inland during the late 1880s, creating Manicaland in the eastern Mashona country. They founded Beira, a port on Rhodes's proposed Pungwe site, in 1890. Portugal issued the so-called Pink Map around this time, laying claim to the very corridor of land between Angola and Mozambique that Rhodes desired. The British government issued a firm ultimatum against the Portuguese claims in January 1890. Lisbon swiftly acquiesced and left the area open for the company's drive north. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Territorial expansion and consolidation. Pioneer Column The Pioneer Column, initially comprising about 100 volunteers referred to as «pioneers», was raised by the company during 1890. 
Led by Major Frank Johnson, a 23-year-old adventurer, the column was designed by the company to be the instrument by which it would not only acquire Mashanaland, but also begin its development. Men from a wide variety of backgrounds therefore filled its ranks, according to one member. Prospectors predominate, but nearly every trade and profession under the sun is represented. One troop is called the gentlemanly troop because the majority in it are brokers. Most of the pioneers self identified as South African rather than British, and many of them were Afrikaners. At Rhodes's insistence, several sons of the Cape Colony's leading families were also included. Each pioneer was promised 3,000 acres 12 square kilometers of land and 15 mining claims in return for his service. La Bengala gave his approval to the ostensibly non military expedition, but many of his Azinduna advisors were fiercely against it, seeing it as an appropriation of Matabili territory. Wary that one or more of these Azinduna might turn rogue and attack the pioneers, the company gradually enlarged the escorting detachment of British South Africa Company's police until it numbered 500 men, headed by Lieutenant Colonel Edward Penfather, an officer seconded from the British Army. To Johnson's chagrin, the Imperial officer was also given ultimate command of the column. The column was to move roughly east from McLeod Sea, a small camp near the border of Matabuland and Bichwanaland, and then march north to its destination. It would build a road as it went, founding minor forts along the way, and establish a major town in Mashanaland, whereupon the pioneers would be released to farm, prospect and trade. Frederick Courtney Selu, a famed hunter with intimate knowledge of Mashanaland, was made the column's intelligence officer. He chose as its intended destination an open patch of veldt he had discovered during his travels, which he called Mount Hampton. The proposed site was about 650 kilometers (400 miles) to the northeast of McLeod Sea. The column departed on the 28th of June 1890, and on the 11th of July crossed the Thule River into Matabuland. Its first settlement, Fort Thule, was inaugurated near the riverbank. Though Johnson was nominally in command of the pioneers, he was generally seen as untried and green when contrasted with the experienced, respected authority of Selu. According to most contemporary accounts, Selu was effectively in control. The officers were outwardly harmonious, but Johnson was privately troubled by pangs of jealousy. The column was initially accompanied by about 200 N Guato provided by the Sawana chief Kama, who had firmly aligned his country with Britain. The Nguato provided much assistance in building the new road, but animosity soon developed between them and the whites, principally because the latter were not used to treating blacks as equals. By mutual consent, the Nguato returned home. As the column continued its march north, Selu split off with a small section and headed east to challenge the Portuguese in Manicaland. Penfather and Johnson continued at the head of the main force and founded Fort Victoria, Fort Charter, and, on 12 September, Fort Salisbury. The site of Salisbury was a naturally flat and marshy meadow, bounded by a rough copy. The pioneers were about 15 kilometers, 9.3 miles short of Mount Hampton, but Penfather climbed the copy, surveyed the open veldt and insisted that it was magnificent. So they need go no further. He reported back to Rhodes in triumphant tones, site selected. All well. Magnificent country. Natives pleased to see us. 
On the morning of 13 September 1890, about 10 o'clock, the officers and men of the Pioneer Column paraded atop the copy before an improvised flagstaff. With the column standing to attention, Lieutenant Edward Tyndale Biscoe hoisted the Union Jack, a 21-gun salute was fired, and three cheers were given for the Queen. Work then began on the fort, which was completed by the end of September. The Pioneer Column was then disbanded. Eastern skirmishes with Portugal Instructed by Rhodes to hurry east, Selu met with the Manica chief, M. Tassa, on 14 September 1890, and agreed with him a concession whereby M. Tassa promised not to ally with any other foreign power, and granted the company exclusive rights to mine within his territory, as well as to build railways, bridges, canals and other projects typical of colonial settlement. In return, the company gave M. Tassa rifles and other equipment worth £100 in total, and a promise of protection against attacks by the Portuguese or the neighbouring Shangan or Sanga people. Portugal dispatched a small force to militarily overwhelm M. Tassa and reclaim the area in early November 1890. Captain Patrick Forbes rode to M. Tassa's aid from Salisbury, quickly routed the Portuguese, and thereupon advanced all the way to Beira, securing further concessions from local chiefs along the way to build a railroad. Tense negotiations between Britain and Portugal followed, finally concluding with a treaty signed in Lisbon on the 11th of June 1891. Prominent among the numerous territorial revisions was the integration of Manicaland into the company domain as part of Mashonaland. Britain concurrently recognised Portugal's authority over the entire Mozambican coast, putting an end to Rhodes's designs for a company port on the Mozambique Channel. <laughs> North to Katanga Representatives of the company crossed the Zambezi to venture even further north. The Shire Highlands of Nyasaland, far to the northeast on the banks of Lake Nyasa, had been settled by a modest number of British missionaries for about a decade, and in Baratsland, to the northwest, King Luanica hosted François Coillard of the Paris Evangelical Missionary Society. Rhodes sent Elliot Lochner north to negotiate with Luanica in late 1889, and in June 1890 the King signed the Lochner Concession, which gave the company rights to mine, trade and build railways in Baratsland in return for British protection over his domain from external threats, and a British resident in Luandica's court at Lilui. The British government thereupon chartered the company to defend Baratsland, as well as all country to the east as far as Nyasaland, and to the north as far as Lake Tanganyika and Katanga, a country where resources were scarce and tropical disease was rampant. Baratsland offered comparatively few economic opportunities for the company and little incentive for white immigration. The main objective of Lochner's expedition was all along to clear a path towards Katanga, a mineral-rich area further north, where M. Siri ruled the Yeke Kingdom. Katanga was also coveted by the owner of the Congo Free State, King Leopold II of the Belgians, whose representatives Rhodes hoped to beat there. I want you to get Masiri's. Rhodes told one of his agents, Joseph Thompson, "'I mean Katanga. You must go and get Katanga.'" 
The efforts of Thomson and Alfred Sharp to secure a company concession over the area were furiously rebuffed by M. Seary in late 1890, and ultimately foiled by the 1891–92 Stairs Expedition. A multinational force in Leopold's service, led by a Canadian British Army officer, Captain William Grant Stairs which violently clashed with the obstreperous M. Seary, and eventually shot him dead when an attempt to arrest him turned into a firefight. M. Seary had been in the habit of displaying the heads of his enemies atop poles outside his boma enclosure, and the expedition's men hoisted his own head alongside them in an attempt to strike fear into the locals. The country promptly capitulated to the Free State, ending the company's expansion north. The company did little to fulfill Britain's obligations to Luandika, having failed in Katanga. Its hierarchy saw Baratsland as an unworkable inconvenience that might later be exchanged with Portugal. Whitehall, by contrast, regarded Luandica's domain as an important buffer against further Portuguese claims inland. Neither the company nor the British government proved eager to take practical responsibility for the Baratsi. In 1894, while informing Britain of his willingness to administer on Whitehall's behalf north of the Zambezi, Rhodes stressed that he would not take Baratsland. The promised British resident at Lilui remained conspicuously absent, despite Luandika's repeated inquiries, until the appointment by Rhodes of Robert Thorne Corindon in 1897. Topic: <laughs> Matabili Wars, the First Chimarenga. Though the company made good on most of the pledges it had made to local leaders in Matabeland, the ascent of Labengala and other less prominent figures, particularly regarding mining rights, was often evaded, misrepresented or simply ignored. Company officials also demanded that Labengala cease the habitual raids on Mashona villages by Matabili Impi's regiments. Enraged by what he perceived as slights against his authority, Labengala made war on Mashanaland in 1893. Matabili warriors began the wholesale slaughter of Mashonas near Fort Victoria in July that year. The company organized an Indaba tribal conference to try to end the conflict, but this failed. The first Matabili War had begun. The company moved on Labengala during October and early November 1893, and used the inexorable firepower of its Maxim machine guns to crush attacks by the far larger Matabili army as it rode southwest. As the whites approached his royal town at Bulawayo, Labengala fled, torching it as he went. Company troops were dispatched to bring him back, and the resultant pursuit north ended with the ambush and annihilation of the 34-man Shangani patrol by the remnants of Labengula's army on 4 December 1893. The king died from smallpox while on his way north in January 1894, and his Azinduna made peace with the company soon after. Bulawayo was rebuilt as a company-run city atop the ruins of the former Matabili capital. Rhodes subsequently funded education for three of Labengula's sons. The Matabili rose again in 1896 at the behest of M. Limo, a spiritualist leader who was revered as a god by much of the local populace. The botched Jameson raid on the Transvaal at the end of 1895 had severely depleted the company's garrison in Matabuland, and the settlers in Bulawayo had little to defend themselves with. M. Limo convinced his followers that the white man was responsible for all their ills. 
hut tax, forced work, locusts, rinderpest, drought and so on, and that he and other tribal prophets could ensure the success of a massed rebellion by turning the settlers' bullets into water. This uprising, called the Second Matabili War or the First Chimarenga Liberation War, began in March 1896. Over the following three months the Matabili killed hundreds of isolated settlers and their families, but Bulawayo itself held out. When the company mustered reinforcements from South Africa, the Matabili retreated into the Matopos Hills. Here, Frederick Russell Burnham, an American scout long in company service, discovered and killed M. Limo in June 1896. Starting in August 1896, Rhodes personally played a key role in ending the Matabili insurgency. With one of the widows of Mazilakazi Labengula's father acting as a go-between, the company and the rebel Azinduna arranged an indaba for 21 August, the Azinduna agreed to meet Rhodes and three companions in the Matopos Hills. At this meeting, the insurgents vehemently protested against their prior treatment under company rule, prompting Rhodes to walk away from the other whites and to sit among the Matabili instead, apparently intending to symbolically demonstrate empathy and a spirit of reconciliation. He told the Matabili that he was on their side, and that he would personally ensure the non recurrence of any abuses. The Azinduna would be fully restored to the status they had held under Labengala, he said, and there would be no retribution against those who had taken part in the Chimaranga. After four hours, it was agreed to continue the talks. Bitterness endured among some of the rebels, but three further Indabas progressed well, and the Matabili rising ended amicably in October 1896. Around the same time, Mashona Svakiro spiritualist prophets, most prominently Mukwati, Kaguvi and Nahanda Nayakasakana, instigated their own Chimaranga in Mashanaland. The company forcibly put down this uprising during 1897, and afterwards took significant steps to demilitarize the tribal population and improve relations with the local chiefs. Small pockets of Mashona unrest continued sporadically until 1903, but peace endured in Matabuland. Including both theatres, the Chimaranga has been estimated to have taken around 8,450 lives, roughly 8,000 blacks died, and about 450 whites, of whom 372 were locally based settlers. The rest were soldiers in company or British service from outside Rhodesia. Topic: Administration. Topic: The name Rhodesia. The company initially referred to each territory it acquired by its respective name Mashanaland, Matabuland, and so on but there was no official term for them collectively. Rhodes preferred the name Zambesia, while Leander Starr Jameson proposed Charterland. Many of the first settlers instead called their new home Rhodesia. After Rhodes, this was common enough usage by 1891 for it to be used in newspapers. In 1892 it was used in the name of Salisbury's first newspaper, the Rhodesia Herald. The company officially adopted the name Rhodesia in 1895, and three years later the UK government followed suit. It is not clear why the name should have been pronounced with the emphasis on the second rather than the first syllable. 
the historian Robert Blake comments, but this appears to have been the custom from the beginning and it never changed. Topic: <laughs> Administrative divisions and centers. Matabeleland and Mashanaland, both of which lay south of the Zambezi, were officially referred to collectively as Southern Rhodesia", from 1898, and formally united under that name in 1901. Meanwhile, the areas to the rivers north became northwestern and northeastern Rhodesia, which were governed separately, and amalgamated in 1911 to form northern Rhodesia. The overall centre of company administration was Salisbury, which was also the southern Rhodesian capital. The administrative centre in northeastern Rhodesia was Fort Jameson, while in northwestern Rhodesia the capital was Coloma initially, and Livingstone from 1907. Livingstone became the capital of northern Rhodesia when the two northern territories joined in 1911, and remained so at the end of company rule. Topic: Administrative posts, politics, and legislature. The head of government in each territory under company rule was, in effect, a regional administrator appointed by the company. In southern Rhodesia, a ten-man legislative council first sat in 1899, originally made up of the administrator himself five other members nominated by the company, and four elected by registered voters. The number of elected members rose gradually under company rule until they numbered 13 in 1920, sitting alongside the administrator and six other company officials in the 20-member legislative council. The company's royal charter was originally due to run out in October 1914, but it was renewed for a further ten years in 1915. In northern Rhodesia, administration was entirely undertaken by the company until 1917, when an advisory council was introduced, comprising five elected members. This council did little to lighten the company's administrative burden north of the river, but endured until the end of company rule. <laughs> <laughs> development Railways <laughs> 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 and the telegraph Chief among the endeavours pursued by the company during its early years were the construction of railroads and telegraph wires across the territory it governed. These respective arteries of transport and communication, vital both for the successful development of the new country and for the realization of Rhodes's Cape to Cairo Dream, were laid across the previously bare Rhodesian landscape with great speed. Strategically planned, the railways were not intended or expected to turn a profit during their early years, their construction was largely subsidized by the company. The telegraph line from Mafeking in South Africa reached Salisbury—one third of the way from Cape Town to Cairo—in February 1892. Just under six years later, in December 1897, the Bichwanaland Railway from Vreeburg reached Bulawayo, making it possible to travel between the Cape and Rhodesia by train. A narrow gauge railway towards Salisbury from the Mozambican port of Beira was begun by the Portuguese in 1892, and reached the Rhodesian border at Umtali after six years. Umtali and Salisbury were linked in 1899. On a different track gauge, the gauges between Beira and Salisbury were regularized the following year. 
The Second Boer War then restricted the further extension of the line from Vreeburg, but the completion of the Beira Salisbury Railway allowed the importation of materials. Salisbury was connected to Bulawayo and the Cape in 1902. The Vreeburg Bulawayo Railway was meanwhile extended up to the Zambezi, and across when the Victoria Falls Bridge opened in 1905. Continuing through northwestern Rhodesia, the railway reached Elizabethville in Katanga by this time part of the Belgian Congo in 1910. Topic. Agriculture and land distribution, the rise of Rhodesian tobacco The company originally hoped that gold prospecting between the Limpopo and Zambezi rivers would reveal mineral deposits comparable to those of the South African RAND, and indeed acquired its charter in part because its founders convinced Whitehall that a second RAND would be found and exploited in what would become southern Rhodesia, thereby providing more than enough capital to develop the territory without help from London. Though much gold was discovered during the 1890s, these grand expectations were not met. The company resolved after about a decade that it could not financially sustain its domain through gold mining alone, and therefore shifted its priority to the development of white agriculture. To maximize the potential of new, white run farms, the company launched a wide scale land settlement program for white settlers. As part of this drive it reorganized the geographical distribution of native reserve areas, moving the reserves and often reducing them in size where the land was of particularly high quality. To ensure that the white farmers would retain the reliable access to markets that the nascent railway network provided, tribal reserve boundaries in various relevant places were redrawn by the company to place the railway lines outside. The new hut taxes concurrently compelled black peasants to find paid work, which could be found in the new agricultural industry, though most tribesmen were reluctant to abandon their traditional lifestyles in favor of the capitalist labor market. Managers at farms and mines often had great trouble sourcing sufficient manpower. Tobacco, initially just one of several crops earmarked for wholesale production, soon emerged as southern Rhodesia's most prominent agricultural product, though its early development was far from stable. Aside from the climactic uncertainties of the unfamiliar country and the mercurial quality of the product, the early industry was cursed by a debilitating boom and bust cycle that continued well into the 1920s. All the same, tobacco endured as the territory's staple crop, while the growers came to dominate southern Rhodesian politics, holding a majority in the Legislative Council from 1911. Holding considerable political and economic power up to the end of company rule in 1923, the southern Rhodesian tobacco industry retained its prominent position for decades afterwards. <laughs> Immigration and economic performance White immigration to the company realm was initially modest, but intensified during the 1900s and early 1910s, particularly south of the Zambezi. The economic slump in the Cape following the Second Boer War motivated many white South Africans to move to southern Rhodesia, and from about 1907 the company's land settlement program encouraged more immigrants to stay for good. 
The southern Rhodesian mining and farming industries advanced considerably during this period. Southern Rhodesia's annual gold output grew in worth from 610,389 pounds in 1901 to 2,526,007 pounds in 1908. The territory first balanced revenue and expenditure in 1912. There were 12,586 W. Whites in southern Rhodesia in 1904, and 23,606 in 1911. In 1927, four years after the end of company rule, the black and white populations in southern Rhodesia were respectively 922,000 and 38,200. The white population north of the river was far smaller, with only about 3,000 settlers spread across the 300,000 square miles square kilometers of northern Rhodesia. In the same area, there were roughly one million black people. The whites in northern Rhodesia were primarily concentrated in the far west, along the railway line between Bulawayo and Elizabethville in the Belgian Congo. A community of about 250 lived in the vicinity of Fort Jameson near the eastern border. In between were vast swathes of largely uninhabited bush, which lacked roads, railways and telegraph lines, making communication between the two white communities very difficult. The amalgamation of northwestern and northeastern Rhodesia in 1911 did little to improve the situation. Northern Rhodesia suffered as the result of its artificial nature. The country was not homogeneous in terms of population, history or geography. And unlike southern Rhodesia, it never turned a profit or became self-supporting. During 1921 alone, the company's administration of northern Rhodesia lost it more than £1,250,000. Topic: Military and Police. Topic: Evolution of the Southern Rhodesian Police. In line with the terms of its Royal Charter, the company formed the British South Africa Company's Police (BSACP) in late 1889. A paramilitary, mounted infantry force, the BSACP initially boasted 650 men, but it proved so expensive to maintain that it was reduced to only 40 in 1892. This rump force was renamed the Mashanaland Mounted Police. With its size regularly fluctuating, it and other more irregular units, Prominently the Bulawayo Field Force, including figures such as Selu and Burnham as commanders, proceeded to play a central role in the two Matabili Wars of the 1890s. Following the formation of the Matabiland Mounted Police in 1895 with 150 members, it and the Mashanaland Force were collectively referred to as the Rhodesia Mounted Police. This was run directly by the company until 1896, when it was reorganised into an independent entity called the British South Africa Police The word, ''Rhodesia'' was omitted at the insistence of the British colonial secretary, Joseph Chamberlain, because Britain did not yet formally consider that the country's name, despite the company's official adoption of it the year before. 
This anomaly was resolved in 1898, but the BSAP name remained. Police forces in southern Rhodesia were initially all white, but this changed over time. The native police force, first raised in May 1895, was made up entirely of Matabele noncommissioned officers and men, many of whom were veterans of Labengula's impis. Its 200 members, of whom 50 were posted to Mashanaland, were trained in the Western manner, drilling and learning marksmanship. They were held in high regard by their white officers for their formidable soldiering ability, but they became hugely unpopular among the black civilian population for their perceived arrogance and abuse of the law they were supposed to uphold. At the 1896 Indaba with roads in the Matopos Hills, the Matabili chief Somabhalana complained at length about the native police, saying they did not respect the traditional tribal structure and generally oppressed the populace, reportedly raping women on a regular basis. The parties agreed to abolish the native police in Matabuland, and Rhodes promised not to reintroduce it. On its reconstitution in 1896, the BSAP was authorized to recruit 600 officers and men in Matabuland all of whom were white because of Rhodes's promise at the Indaba and 680 in Mashanaland, of whom 100 should be black. In practice, the Native contingent in Mashanaland numbered 120. The BSAP thereafter operated alongside the Southern Rhodesian Constabulary (SRC), a town police force covering Salisbury, Bulawayo, Fort Victoria, Guelo, and Umtali. The Constabulary was far smaller than the BSAP. In 1898 it included only 156 officers and men, black and white—and it was run by local magistrates, as opposed to the paramilitary BSAP, which had a military-style structure. The commissioned ranks in the BSAP were entirely white, but the number of black constables in its ranks gradually rose, with many being recruited abroad. This kind of recruitment was not uncommon in colonial Africa, as many white officials of the day believed that blacks who policed their own communities were easily corruptible, and often not inclined to properly ensure the payment of colonial institutions such as hut tax. In southern Rhodesia, many constables came from Baratsland, Zululand and Zanzibar. Locally sourced black policemen were officially reintroduced to Matabeland in 1904. That year, the force nominally contained 550 whites and 500 blacks. The SRC was merged into the BSAP in 1909, putting law enforcement in southern Rhodesia into the hands of a single authority for the first time. Following the end of company rule in 1923, the BSAP endured as Southern Rhodesia's police force. <laughs> Policing north of the Zambezi Northeastern Rhodesia was initially policed by locally recruited rank and filers, led by white officers from south of the river. The first force was raised in 1896. During its early years, it busied itself eliminating the slave trade, in which foreign traders, mostly Arabs, captured villagers for sale as slaves overseas. A more regular police force was then introduced by the company in each of the northern territories. Because there were so few white immigrants to northeastern Rhodesia, and because most of them were men of the church or of business rather than potential recruits, 
The northeastern Rhodesia Constabulary was almost exclusively black, including all of its non commissioned officers. Northwestern Rhodesia attracted more white immigrants than its northeastern counterpart, and its police force initially comprised an all white detachment of company police seconded from southern Rhodesia. The unit proved expensive to maintain, however, and many of its constables fell victim to the unfamiliar tropical diseases of Baratslin. Local black constables were introduced in 1900 after the company unsuccessfully attempted to recruit more whites. In 1902, the Baratsi Native Police was formed, with Bemba, Ngoni and Isla recruits making up most of the ranks. Minor forces of white policemen were formed in the towns north of the Zambezi. After northwestern and northeastern Rhodesia merged into northern Rhodesia in 1911, the police forces were amalgamated as the Northern Rhodesia Police (NRP). Like the BSAP, the NRP was effectively a paramilitary rather than civil organization, with its armed constables receiving martial training under military command. Because they were not trained in the civil manner considered normal in a more developed country, most of them were illiterate. The main purpose of the force during the early 1910s was not to police northern Rhodesia's towns, but rather to prevent and combat potential uprisings. The constables were also considered suitable for use as soldiers in the bush. It was not a large force. Just before the outbreak of the World War I in 1914, it had only 800 personnel. Topic. Rhodesian military involvement abroad Topic. Second Boer War The BSAP served in the Second Boer War of 1899–1902 in its paramilitary capacity, with the newly formed Rhodesia Regiment also taking part, drawing most of its men from the Southern Rhodesia Volunteers. Rhodesia contributed approximately 1,000 men in all, about 20% of the white male population at the time. Rhodesia contributed part of the British garrison at the Battle of the Elands River in August 1900, during which a 500-man force made up principally of Australians and Rhodesians held off attacks from a far larger Boer army under General Coos de la Rey, and repeatedly refused offers of safe passage in return for surrender. Captain. Sandy. Butters, the Rhodesian commanding officer, encouraged his men with shouts towards the Boers that, "'Rhodesians never surrender!' The Rhodesia regiment was disbanded later that year, shortly after the relief of Mafeking. <laughs> World War I With its fledgling white population largely characterized by youth, hardiness and imperial patriotism, southern Rhodesia proved a bountiful source of volunteers during the First World War, in which about 40% of southern Rhodesian white males of service age fought. The majority of Southern Rhodesian personnel served with British, South African and other regiments on the Western Front in Belgium and France. The company raised exclusively Rhodesian units for African service. Following the start of the war in August 1914, the Rhodesia Regiment was reformed in October, initially comprising 20 officers and 500 men, mostly Southern Rhodesians. 
This force, which became called the 1st Rhodesia Regiment, was sent to the Cape to fight alongside the South Africans in southwest Africa. The 2nd Rhodesia Regiment, raised a month later, was sent to the East African Front. Following the end of the South West African Campaign in 1915, the 1st Rhodesia Regiment was dissolved, most of its men travelled to England to volunteer for the Western Front, while others joined the 2nd in East Africa. Boasting an effective strength of about 800 for the rest of its tour of duty, the 2nd Rhodesia Regiment returned home in April 1917, and disbanded in October, influenced by South Africa's reluctance to use black soldiers in what was widely considered a white man's war. Southern Rhodesia did not recruit blacks in large numbers until 1916, when the number of potential white volunteers not already in uniform became too small to merit further drafts. The Rhodesia Native Regiment was formed in that year to join the 2nd Rhodesia Regiment in East Africa, and included 2,507 men by 1918. Organizers expected that most black volunteers would come from the Matabele people, famous for its martial tradition, and therefore originally named the unit the Matabele Regiment. However, when the ranks proved to be ethnically diverse, the name was changed. Led by white officers, the black soldiers served with distinction in East Africa, soon becoming regarded as formidable bush fighters. Pitted against the German general Mahor Paul von Leto Vorbeck who was mounting a successful guerrilla campaign against the far larger Allied forces they remained in East Africa for the rest of the war, returning home only in December 1918, soon after von Leto Vorbeck surrendered at Abercorn in northern Rhodesia on 25 November. The RNR was thereupon dissolved. <laughs> End of company rule Topic: 1922 Southern Rhodesian Government Referendum. In 1917, the Responsible Government Association (RGA) was formed. This party sought self-government for Southern Rhodesia within the empire, just as Britain had previously granted responsible government to its colonies in Australia, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa as a precursor to full Dominion status. Sir Charles Coghlan, a lawyer based in Bulawayo, led the RGA from 1919. The RGA opposed the proposed integration of Southern Rhodesia into the Union of South Africa, which had been formed in 1910 by the South Africa Act 1909, section 150 of which explicitly provisioned for the accession of territories governed by the British South Africa Company. The company originally stood against Southern Rhodesia's addition, fearing the territory might become dominated by Afrikaners, but abruptly changed its stance when, in 1918, the Privy Council in London ruled that unalienated land in the Rhodesias belonged to the British Crown rather than to the company. This removed the long standing stream of company revenue created by the sale of land. The loss of this source of income hampered the company's ability to pay dividends to its shareholders, and caused its development of the Rhodesias to slow. The company now backed Southern Rhodesia's incorporation into South Africa, hoping its membership in the Union could help solve both problems. 
However, this prospect proved largely unpopular in southern Rhodesia, where most of the settlers wanted self-government rather than rule from Pretoria, and came to vote for the RGA in large numbers. In the 1920 Legislative Council election, the RGA won 10 of the 13 seats contested. A referendum on the colony's future was held on 27 October 1922—at the suggestion of Winston Churchill, then Britain's colonial secretary, continuing the initiative of his preprocessor Lord Milner—and responsible government won the day. Just under 60% of voters backed responsible government from a turnout of 18,810. Marindellas was the only district to favor the union option, doing so by 443 votes to 433. Topic: <laughs> Self-government versus direct rule. Southern Rhodesia was duly annexed by the Empire on 12 September 1923, and granted full self-government on 1 October the same year. The new Southern Rhodesian government immediately purchased the land from the British Treasury for £2 million. The company retained mineral rights in the country until 1933, when they were bought by the colonial government, also for £2 million. The future administration of Northern Rhodesia, a proposition of little economic viability without its southern counterpart, was a burden the company now endeavoured to rid itself of. Negotiations between the company and the British government produced a settlement whereby the territory would become a protectorate under Whitehall, with government transferred to the colonial office in London, which would henceforth appoint a local governor. The company would concurrently keep the country's mineral rights, extensive tracts of freehold property, and half the proceeds from future sales of land in what had been northwestern Rhodesia. Northern Rhodesia duly became an imperial protectorate on 1 April 1924, with Sir Herbert Stanley installed as the inaugural governor. British South Africa Company rule in Rhodesia was thereby ended. See also Copperitocracy Notes and references Notes References Online sources Newspaper and journal articles Bibliography External links Charter of the British South Africa Company <laughs>